from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, DC goes after big tech. The House unleashes sweeping antitrust legislation aimed at Amazon, Alphabet, Google, and Facebook. We'll have all the details. Plus, know thy worth. European fintech giant Klarna just got $639 million from SoftBank. We'll talk to the CEO, Sebastian Semyatkowski, about how things are going now that his company is valued at more than $45 billion. And get ready, gamers, we will highlight the top three predictions for this year's E3 event. All those stories in a moment, but first, U.S. stocks rising to a record with the focus turning to next week's Fed meeting. I want to get the latest from Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow with the full markets picture. Ed, take it away. Yeah, we, we just did enough to etch out a fresh record. Choppy trading on Friday and then a late but small rally in tech stocks taking us over the line. The S&P 500 main gauge of U.S. equities up two tenths of one percent. A slight outperformance in tech shares. You see the Nasdaq 100, a very tech heavy index up by almost three tenths of one percent. That's despite House Democrats, as you say, putting forward a number of antitrust bills that would target the biggest names. But we didn't really see shares like Apple, Amazon, Google move much. There is growing concern, of course, among investors about what kind of a headwind antitrust will be, not just in the United States, but in other jurisdictions like Europe as well. The most pronounced outperformance in tech, in semiconductors really, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index up four tenths of one percent, enough to outdo the pocket of weakness which was biotech. You see Vertex down 10 percent. It's abandoned a planned trial for a drug to cure liver disease. That really weighed on biotech stocks. The biggest points decline are on the Nasdaq 100 as well for Vertex, but you see Biogen, Amgen, both down. And the Nasdaq Biotech Index down by the most in three weeks, uh, around three tenths, uh, th uh, sorry, three quarters of 1%. Also a mixed picture in cryptocurrencies. You know, we pay so much attention to Bitcoin. Bitcoin higher above the 37,000 mark on Friday, but Ethereum uh, on during the session will be down as much as 2%. You see other coins like Litecoin now slightly higher, had been lower. The net result, though, the Bloomberg Ga Galaxy Crypto Index up by around half a percent, and that's because Bitcoin is just so at the heart of what's going on in cryptocurrencies right now. And as always, just take a quick step back and think about the bigger picture, Emily, the bigger context. Because if we look at cryptocurrencies alongside tech stocks over the last couple of months, so much volatility in cryptocurrencies, that's the white line, but it's pretty steady, Eddie when it comes to tech stocks. The Nasdaq 100 being pretty consistent, having its fourth weekly gain and its highest level since April. Emily. All right, Ed Ludlow, thanks for the roundup there. Appreciate it. Meantime, the House Judiciary Committee is cracking the whip on big tech, announcing sweeping new antitrust legislation aimed at Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook. With more on these measures, let's turn to Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton in Washington. Anna, what can you tell us about the most significant aspects of these new bills? Yeah, the measure that's really getting the most attention is the one that would prohibit these companies from having a business that competes with other um, businesses that use their services. So, for example, Apple Music would be a problem because Apple also lists Spotify on its app store. So, you know, there's certain ways that if this bill were to pass, it would require the breaking up of some of these big tech companies. Having said that, we're a long way from these bills actually passing. So, you know, these are proposals that are kind of put out there as, uh, you know, kind of aspirational uh, policy suggestions. But we'll see where they actually go when we get down to the markup, to the committee activity and to an eventual floor vote. Now, both Democrats and Republicans are concerned about big tech, but for vastly different reasons. Are Republicans on board? with this new legislation? It kind of surprised me that Republicans signed on to all five of these bills. So you know, there were five proposals that were put out by David Cicilline, the Rhode Island de Democrat who chairs the House Antitrust Subcommittee. And I think every single Republican on his subcommittee signed on to these bills. Now, he has a really good partnership with uh, Ken Buck, the Colorado Republican who's the ranking member on that subcommittee. So they've done a lot of work together investigating these companies, coming up with these proposals. So there is bipartisan agreement that something needs to be done. But like you said, Republicans do have some different concerns, especially on how conservatives are censored, as they would say, on some of these platforms. 
So how likely is this then to actually become law? You know, it's interesting to look at these five proposals because some of them are more likely than others. But the bar for passing legislation is really high. You know, it's hard to get a bill from the House to the Senate and around the filibuster that requires at this point at least 10 Republican senators to sign on. So that's a really high bar for, for legislation. And I would look at these proposals as more kind of where this policy discussion is going. You know, the more immediate risk for some of these companies is going to be coming from the antitrust agencies, from the FTC, from the DOJ, from cases that will be brought under current law. You know, they'll be watching future proposals, but we're a long way from that actually impacting their bottom line. All right, Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton, thanks so much for the roundup. We're going to continue to beat the drum on this story as this process evolves. Thank you. Meantime, Tesla has shown off its newest vehicle, the Model S Plaid. The car was the focus of an event outside the company's factory in Fremont, California, just south of here, to mark the start of deliveries to customers. CEO Elon Musk talked up the vehicle's engineering prowess, telling the audience that the car can go from zero to 60 miles an hour in less than two seconds. Look at the company's website, Why though, explains that doesn't include the initial roll forward. And uh, I think there, there is something it's, it's, that's quite important um, to the future of sustainable energy, which is that uh, we've we got to show that an electric car is the best car, hands down. That was Elon Musk about the new Plaid model. Coming up, the buy now, pay later trend continuing its momentum on the heels of the pandemic. We're going to speak to the head of Europe's most valuable fintech startup, Klarna CEO Sebastian Semietkowski, next. This is Bloomberg. E-commerce is booming as buy now, pay later companies like Affirm and Klarna are seeing major growth. In an interview earlier with Bloomberg, Affirm CEO Max Levchin attributed to the success to the pandemic. Money was such a top of mind concern during especially the early parts of the pandemic before the stimulus checks came in. And so buy now, pay later experienced this unbelievable moment in 2020 because it is such a simple, transparent way to pay for, for services and goods. Meantime, Klarna, one of a firm's competitors, is now valued at over $45 billion thanks to a recent funding round from SoftBank. Klarna is Europe's most valuable fintech startup. Joining us now, Klarna co-founder and CEO Sebastian Simiakowski. Uh, Sebastian, I don't know if we can call you a startup anymore at $45 billion, but wow. I mean, last time you joined us, you said that you want to disrupt the, the financial services industry just like tes Tesla has disrupted the car market. What's changed between the last time we talked and now? <laughs> well, I think that that is so true still, right? I mean, people don't realize it, but the credit card industry itself, it's been reported that it actually costs low-cost income households in the U.S. $70, and it transfers $700 into high-income households. Uh, it's one of the most effective redistributions of wealth that exists. And fortunately, more recently, consumers have started realizing this. Debit has grown five times over credit in the last 10 years. And the pandemic has you know, further accelerated this. We've seen over $150 billion worth of credit card debt pay down, which is fantastic. People should be using debit cards instead of credit cards. But the problem is that occasionally they do need credit when they shop online or in specific situations. And that's where buy now, pay later, like loan services come in and solve for, for those, uh, for those uh, situations. So, so we're very, very happy about that. And we think this is a very positive change. Your competitors, like a firm, are public companies. At a $45 billion valuation, isn't it time to go public? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I think that, like, I mean, we, we I mean, it's it's obviously, we're very, very proud and happy about this. And I'm, I'm very impressed by all of our colleagues who have contributed to this. We're seeing massive momentum right now in the U.S. It's quite amazing. We're 18 million users now growing over a million a month. We're now live in 80,000 physical stores, which is super exciting as well with Macy's, Sephora. 
um, Foot Locker, among others. But I think, again, I really think about this in a long-term perspective. I mean, we have another company there in the Valley founded by one of those electric guys uh, that you were showcasing earlier. And, you know, they're 10 times larger. And beyond that, there's a whole credit card industry to go after. So we, we sincerely believe that this is just the beginning of it. And maybe along the way, we'll make sense to IPO at some point of time, but it's nothing uh, that is immediate to us right now. We're very focused now on the, on the U.S. and the growth there right now. Okay, one more on that topic, though. Does the funding at all postpone an exit? Because I assume at this valuation, there is pressure for an exit and that the pressure is going up. Well, I actually don't think that's the case. We've been, I mean, I am extremely proud. I've, I've been working with Sequoia for 12 years, and I didn't realize when I got them as an investor how extremely long-term they can be, but they are amazing. They are genuinely long-term. Michael Morris has been on my board for over 10 years They've been supporting us. And over the years, when I've seen what Sequoia has done for us, uh, what I've started doing is trying to find other very long-term shareholders, like bestseller that we have on board today and others. So try to make sure that our cap table is long-term. And that's still the case. And, and, and over the years, that's, that's actually how it's developed. So um, I don't actually feel that pressure. I feel massive support to go off the, the long-term vision of what we're trying to accomplish and make a big dent in this retail banking space. Because it has not thought about consumers. It has been mostly thinking about pocketing money in their own pockets. Uh, so like, uh, you know, so there's a massive opportunity to actually be part of shrinking this industry, which is what we're really about. We want to shrink this industry, makes it smaller, but hopefully our shareholders will benefit by us having a slightly larger part of a smaller pie. Okay. Now, last time we spoke, uh, your position on crypto was clear. You said you were worried. You're worried about the risk. You're worried about people losing money. Now that we've seen all this volatility, has that changed your position at all? If Bitcoin is lower, does that make it a, a better bet? Uh, where's your head right now? Right now? Yeah, no, I, I always want to be mindful when I spoke, speak about it, because if you say something positive, uh, about Bitcoin, then the second, you know, there's 2 million tweets about it and it's promoted as another verification of it. And I, I, I think maybe this technology will prove to be something interesting and disruptive. And I, I sincerely hope that's the case. It would be obviously fun since I do think that there's some interesting promises of it. But at the same point of time, I'm just worried that like if I would like to take Klarna stock and advertise it like Bitcoin is being advertised, at least uh, with all the jurisdictions I'm familiar with, I would probably be fined or even put in jail. You're not allowed to um, advertise financial instruments, especially such with high risk, without you know proper disclaimers. And I think that's for a good reason. And I'm a little bit uh, worried when I see uh, people advertising Bitcoin. So an ad this other day that you know in the metro in London or in the subway in London saying like Bitcoin is even here now, just go and buy it. No disclaimers, nothing. It just uh, makes me worried. All right. You're launching in new markets. What, what will you do with this new infusion of cash? W you know, what's next on the road to this great ambition to disrupt finance like Tesla has done to the car industry? Well, I think that like, hey, we launched France this, uh, uh, this week, we're very proud of, so that's great. Um, that means that we now cover over 20 countries, uh, which is quite cool. And uh, we want to continue that. I think that, you know, the traditional retail banking has been kind of more local, but very broad in services. The future is more specialized. We want to be about people's everyday purchases. And so obviously country expansion is going to continuously be important. But also what we found is a lot of amazing fintech startups out there who have these amazing products of how they want to simplify people's lives, save them time, save them money, uh, you know, make them less worried about their finances, but they're lacking distribution. That's a lot of the parts of like banking has been able to sustain these barriers of entry because it's a scale game and because cost of cost, uh, customer acquisition has been extremely high. So make it very, very difficult for new services to come in and compete. And we think that, you know, part of this could be obviously us merging with such companies and partnering up with them to help them distribute fantastic uh, products to consumers to further, uh, you know, reduce their cost for financial services. I mean, it was in The Economist that every human being on the planet pays $350 a year to uh, cost of financial services. That just doesn't make sense. We have to take that down. That money can stay with consumers and society. All right. Well, Sebastian, thanks so much for waking up for us. Klarna co-founder and CEO, appreciate you joining us from the other side of the world uh, this, your evening. Um, thanks for stopping by. Okay, coming up, U.S. Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee on potential disinformation being spread on big tech platforms. Her concerns next, and we'll challenge them.
We're also getting closer to finding out who will join Jeff Bezos on Blue Origin's first passenger flight aboard the new Shepard. More than 7,500 people from 159 countries have registered to take part in the auction for that coveted seat. The winning bid will be announced Saturday, 12.45 p.m. Eastern Time. The money will be donated to Blue Origin's foundation aimed at inspiring children to pursue STEM-based careers. This is Bloomberg. Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee has been highly critical of Dr. Anthony Fauci, saying that he knew more about the origins of COVID-19 than he originally stated publicly. Earlier, Senator Blackburn also told me she believes that big tech companies like Facebook held back COVID-19 information. Take a listen. One of the things that we're looking at is the coziness between Dr. Fauci and Mark Zuckerberg and the chain of emails there. And then you look at what uh, Big Tech did, what Facebook did in saying, OK, we're going to disallow any of the posts that have to do with the Wuhan lab leak theory which was definitely plausible because we knew that our diplomatic scientists had complained about this lab. Uh, we knew that there were concerns in 2018 about this lab and some of their practices and processes. You know, when it comes to big tech and the fact that so many people receive their news over social media, big tech has a lot of sway in what the American public can see and hear and say. So this was uh, one of their overreaches. And now, because of the email exchanges, we know that what they were doing is working with Dr. Fauci on a PR campaign that would cherry pick information that they would choose to push forward. Are you asserting for certain that COVID-19 came from a lab in Wuhan? No, I'm not asserting for certain. We know that um, Ube province was locked down by the Chinese Communist Party, and those individuals in Wuhan could not go somewhere else in China, but they could go out to the Wuhan International Airport, get on a plane, and fly anywhere else that they wanted to fly. We do know that research was taking place in this lab. We do know that there were concerns over this lab and their practices. We know that there were three researchers that became ill with a mystery illness in November of 2019. So all of this leads us to say it is important that we find out exactly what happened. You know, Emily, three and a half million people lost their lives. We have hundreds of thousands of Americans. We have families that experience loss of a loved one. We have loss of livelihood that millions of Americans or hundreds of thousands of Americans have experienced. We have so many children that lost a full year of learning that are now having um, emotional issues because of a lack of socialization, because of right. all of these reasons, we need answers. So who on the Democratic side is working with you? Because it seems like both Democrats and Republicans want to take action on big tech, but for totally different reasons. And I wonder where that ends. Well, you know, uh, Senator Blumenthal is the chairman, and I'm the ranking Republican on the Consumer Protection Data Security Subcommittee at Commerce. And earlier today, he and I did a roundtable uh, together. Uh, focusing on this, there are good conversations and there is a good bit of uh, synergy around uh, holding big tech accountable and looking at these issues. And I think you'll see us do something this year. 
Now, you're also pushing a bill that would ban big tech companies like Facebook and Twitter from discriminating against users for their political views, which you believe is happening. However, it is hard for some people to believe that conservative voices are being censored on Facebook, for example, when so much of the, the Capitol riot uh, was planned on Facebook. Uh, again, you know, what's the evidence that this is happening to the extent that you believe it is? One of the things that you can look at is this lab theory that they decided they were going to block. Uh, sometimes I will put up things and they will block it because content moderators do not agree with whatever it is that I am, uh, I am putting up. Now, what we know is that Big Tech said they were going to be the new public square and they should be the new public square. Uh, but information, and that is why set reforming Section 230 is important, uh, and getting to things that um, would cause personal harm, eliminating that, uh, changing some of that language around Section 230, that is an important thing that we are going to be taking up. And I think you'll see us work on this in a bipartisan basis which is how it should be done. And back to the lab leak theory, I, you know, obviously, you know, you're concerned about Dr. Fauci's conversations with Mark Zuckerberg. Um, obviously, Dr. Fauci was talking to President Trump um, to, at great length. Why didn't President Trump pursue this lab leak theory if it is in fact true? Well, we would like to know, we would like to know what, uh, what Dr. Fauci and his team, how much information did they share? with uh, President Trump and Vice President Pence. We would also like to know why there were career uh, bureaucrats over at the State Department that were trying to slow walk the investigation that Secretary Pompeo was doing. And then we would also likewise like to know why President Biden decided to end the State Department's investigation and then turn around the following day and say to the Intel Committee, but we want you to come back to us with a report. Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn there of Tennessee. Coming up, 10 U.S. Senators are pitching a bipartisan infrastructure deal. In it, rural broadband. We're going to get reaction from acting chair of the FCC, Jessica Rosenworcel, next. Plus, later, a look at Tesla's latest and fastest model, the S Plaid, which Elon Musk says will prove the superiority of electric cars. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's to get to some of the top tech market stories of the day with our Ed Ludlow. Ed, what are you following? Yeah, I'm looking at customer survey software provider Medallia. Stock has been bumbling along for a couple of days. Then on Friday, whoosh, Bloomberg Scoop hits the terminal. The company is considering options, including selling itself. And it seems like private equity is circling. Let's bring some of the details up on the board. The context here is that we have seen private equity look at the public uh, software, public cloud space a lot. Multi-million, billion, uh, billion dollar, I should say, buyouts, including companies like Cloudera, Proofpoint. It looks like Medallia, according to sources, could be up next. Usual caveats that no deal might happen. It could choose to remain publicly traded. But it's pretty interesting. The next story I want to bring you to is over in France with Amazon. Really interesting. Amazon has won the rights to broadcast live the top flight of French soccer, League 1 or League 1. And it's pushed out a mainstay of French broadcasting, Canal Plus. And if we bring up some of the details of that deal, very fascinating. According to one source, they're paying 333 million US dollars a year for a number of years. But what's fascinating is that the French soccer body, the LFP, offered 300 games to Amazon and 76 to Canal Plus. Canal turned them down and walked away because it was not happy with the deal. I just wanted to flag that story. Really interesting example of disruption. Amazon coming in, live sports, and disrupting traditional broadcast. Emily. All right. Ed, thanks for the roundup. Lots to consider.
Meantime, over to Washington, a bipartisan group of U.S. senators is pitching a $1.2 trillion infrastructure spending deal. It's still well below the level that President Biden had been pushing for. Joining us now in Washington, FCC Acting Chair Jessica Rosenworcel. Uh, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. Always good to have you. Um, curious about what your take is on this plan versus Biden's plan and whether it's enough to expand rural broadband on either side. Well, I think the thing we all have to recognize is that before this pandemic, someone might have said that broadband's just nice to have. I, I think the last 15 months have proven conclusively that it's need to have for everyone everywhere. And as a result, you see a lot of support, in fact, on a bipartisan basis for broadband being in the next infrastructure package. And I think that's a really good thing. You've talked about the homework gap you know, talking about the folks who don't have access, who can't do homework at home. Do you think that post-pandemic that gap is going to get bigger or will it get better? Nope, it's going to get better. And here's why. Uh, the FCC is starting later this month a big program to help end the homework gap. We have a new fund of just over $7 billion for schools and libraries across the country. And it's designed to help them get laptops, computers, routers, Wi-Fi hotspots, modems, what have you, into the hands of students who need them so that they won't ever again be locked out of the virtual classroom. And I hope that this program is just the start. I think in the United States, we should commit to ending the homework gap once and for all. Indeed. Amen. Um, meantime, your fellow commissioner, Brendan Carr, just penned a big op-ed calling on big tech to pay into the FCC's Universal Service Fund to support more of the building of, of infrastructure infra that, that, that their services demand. Do you think companies like Apple and Amazon and Google and Facebook and Netflix should be footing more of the bill? Well, you know, it's an intriguing idea, and we're going to need ideas because the universal service system that the Federal Communications Commission runs, well, it was set up by a law from 1996 when I had a Palm Pilot and an AOL account. So um, it's okay to look at fresh ideas. I appreciate that my colleague is coming up with his own, but in the end, those choices are really going to be made by Congress. And I hope we can have a good discussion about it because keeping the Universal Service Fund strong is really important for making sure that broadband helps reach rural America and also provide support for broadband and affordability in urban America. Now, you know I'm going to ask you this every time you come on until something changes, but you are still acting chair. President Biden has yet to name a chair, a permanent chair of the FCC. Do you have any idea why there's a delay, who this person's going to be, and is it going to be you? Well, these questions are above my pay grade, but I can tell you we're getting a lot done at the agency. <laughs> We set up that homework gap fund. We have a new program for broadband affordability. We're now mapping where broadband is and is not all throughout the country. And we've got the next big auction of 5G spectrum coming up this fall. So we're not letting it stop us. We are getting things done and I'm proud of that. So let's talk about how fast you can do this work because right now, because you're acting chair, it means that the commission is evenly split, two Democrats, two Republicans, and it'll remain so until the White House acts on FCC nominations. How is that impacting the agency's work? Is it slowing you down? Would you get done this work more quickly if you could lead an FCC with a Democratic majority? Well, you know, I wake up every day and I recognize it's bipartisan or bust, so we are getting things done, and I'm working really hard to talk to my colleagues as often as I can about what we have on our agenda. Uh, we've got work coming up on network security next week, on expanding telehealth. We've got work coming up on wireless emergency alerts, on reducing robocalls, and we're just going to keep moving and finding a way forward. Uh, I think it's too important. Communications is too important for our economy as a whole to really stop and uh, wait for personnel changes. So we're getting a lot done. Absolutely. Well, talking about stopping, I know that ransomware attacks, it's not the FCC's job to stop them. But I'm wondering, what is or can the FCC do to help make our networks more secure? Well, the truth is we are connecting more people, more places, more things in our world and our economy than ever before. And as a result, we are expanding the attack fabric 
and expanding the likelihood of cybersecurity incidents. So I think that everyone in the government needs to pay attention to this, the FCC included, but we're gonna need a whole of government approach where we all work together so we can make sure that security is front of mind. I mean, right now at the agency, we are looking at where there's insecure network equipment across the country. We're identifying it, we're ripping it out. We have a new $1.9 billion fund to help replace it. And at the same time, we are building a record for expanding open radio access networks, which is a new kind of software-based technology that can help diversify network equipment vendors and improve security. So we're trying to both um, clean up our networks, improve cybersecurity, but also invest in the future. All right, uh, acting Chairwoman Jessica rosen of the FCC. Always good to have you here on the show. Appreciate the work you're doing and keeping the ball moving. Thank you. Okay, coming up, Tesla unveils a new, quote, crazy fast vehicle, which Elon Musk says is the best car on the market. How good is it really, though? We'll have more details next. This is Bloomberg. Elon Musk has long touted the superiority of electric cars, and now he has a new vehicle to show off. The new Model S Plaid, said to be Tesla's fastest car yet. Shares are slightly down, though, indicating a lackluster market reaction to the product. Joining us now to discuss is Emmanuel Rosner, Deutsche Bank's lead auto analyst. So Tesla says it's the best car in the world. Is it? Well, it's definitely the fastest car that's ever been produced or mass produced under two seconds from zero to 60. So that's obviously incredibly impressive performance. Um, I think in terms of the rest, you know, from the investor's point of view, what really matters here is making sure Tesla remains on top of uh, the EV technology. And then more importantly, that he can really bring um, affordability of its other vehicles uh, to the mass market. Uh, this is very much a niche vehicle. This is one that drives the brand. This drives the excitement. I think it's very exciting. But in the in reality, down the line, what's really going to move the numbers is can they sell a lot of vehicles? Can they make essentially EV ubiquitous? And we think Tesla is very much at the forefront of that. They scrapped the Plaid Plus. What do you infer from that? It's um, th there may be a whole lot of reason. I think that uh, pr primarily the um, the range uh, with the Plaid of 390 miles is probably more than enough for the overwhelming majority of uh, users. Um, I also think that in order to get to the uh, even larger range, they were counting potentially on uh, their new batteries, which may not completely ready for mass market production. So it wouldn't necessarily rule it out you know, forever, but I think at 390 miles of range, uh, you could even get actually better range out of their battery pack if you don't take the plat version at 412 miles, uh, more than enough for literally the overwhelming majority of users. Now, next week, you're hosting the Deutsche Bank annual global auto industry conference. You're going to be talking to execs from Ford and GM. And I'm curious, what threat do those legacy players really pose to Tesla? So that's going to be a re very much the crux of our discussion with them. We have the CEO of Ford presenting, the, CF, uh, the CFO of GM, and then a whole bunch of uh, other industry leaders. Um, I think that we're seeing them uh, adopt different strategies. Um, in the case of Ford, uh, for example, they're really starting by focusing on some um, uh, vehicles, specifically uh, on the truck side. Uh, so not really moving into sedans like the Model 3, not really moving into smaller crossovers. GM is adopting a strategy of starting from the very high end. Their very first EV is the Hummer, above $80,000 in terms of sticker price. Then they're moving to Cadillac, which are also smaller volume, more niche vehicles. So they're really starting at uh, you know, somewhat of a neat, more niche, lower volume type of end. So I think what's very exciting about this is they're, I think they're catching up. They're really making a lot of progress. Investors are truly very encouraged by that. And so are we, GM and Ford are going in the right direction. I don't view it as an imminent threat for Tesla for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think Tesla is several years ahead in terms of both battery technology, but also in terms of cost trajectory. Tesla is essentially the only automaker right now 
that could sell a Model 3 at this kind of price point, and it being not only a very strong uh, performance in terms of vehicle, but also very profitable sort of like for the bottom line. So I think there's still a bit of work for mass market automakers to actually get there, but they're certainly making the right investments and they're going in the right direction to transform themselves to be relevant players. All right, Manuel, Manuel Rosner, Deutsche Bank analyst, thanks so much for stopping by. Appreciate it. Okay, meantime, the Chinese ride hailing company Didi revealed a $1.6 billion net loss for 2020 as it filed for an IPO in the United States. It might seek a valuation of as high as $70 billion or $100 billion, somewhere in between. The company has been trading at a valuation of around $95 billion in the private market. I want to get details from our Liana Baker, who covers deals like this. Uh, talk to us about what Didi's IPO means for the U.S. IPO market, Liana. We've had a great year in the IPO markets, but we haven't seen kind of a mega deal that's going to raise like over $10 billion. So this is where Didi comes in. Definitely a vote of confidence for the U.S. IPO market. It's going to be a really hot summer with Didi going out, potentially Robin Hood, and there's a lot set for the fall. Um, it looks like Didi's going for a traditional U.S. listing as opposed to some of the more evolved IPOs we've seen like through direct listings or different ways of going public now, like all these SPAC deals. Didi's biggest rival internationally, Grab, is doing a SPAC deal, as you know. So uh, talk to us about the, the financials here, uh, you know, in comparison to Uber, in comparison to Lyft. What did Didi's numbers look like? As you mentioned before, it is not making a profit. They managed to eke out a profit in their last quarter. It was pretty small. But the numbers are pretty staggering for how much they're bringing in, more than $20 billion in revenue last year. They're only in 14 countries. You might remember that they had a big fight with Uber in their home market of China. Uber ended up exiting, which was a huge win for Didi. So Uber will actually end up another winner here because they're a big shareholder in Didi, uh, SoftBank as well. So there's going to be a lot of winners coming out of this, even though right now Didi isn't making a lot of money and they're still, you know, expanding like crazy. So who are going to be the big winners from this listing? Right. So Uber, as I mentioned, is a big stockholder in DD. We also have SoftBank and Tencent. I think Apple's in there as well. So it's really the who's who in international tech investing that should um, see a nice windfall if the listing is successful. It'll also be a chance for, you know, potentially U.S. retail investors to get in on the IPO. We're seeing, you know, Robinhood and SoFi and on those platforms, they're trying to make it easier for the regular investor to get a piece of IPOs. So we'll, we'll see how the retail investor does. And then institutional investors, of course, in the U.S., this will be a big chance for them to get a piece of this uh, company, which is floating for the first time in the U.S. All right. Liana Baker, who covers deals for Bloomberg, thanks so much for that update. We'll be following Didi every step of the way. Still ahead, video games' biggest week starts this weekend. We're going to give you a full preview of what players can expect from the virtual E3 conference next. And worth a note, chipmaker Intel and NVIDIA both finished Friday in the green. Intel said to be in talks with the semiconductor design startup Sci-5. Interest in Sci-5 has been on the rise since its competitor arm became a takeover interest of NVIDIA. This is Bloomberg. While video game fans won't have a chance to mingle and play with the demos this year, studios still hope to keep up the pandemic-driven momentum with new releases at the all-virtual E3 conference this weekend. Bloomberg News' Jason Schreier gives us his top three predictions for the big event. I'm Jason Schreier, and I cover the video game industry from New York, and here are the top three things we are looking at at this year's E3 event. First up, what is Microsoft going to show? 
last year Microsoft purchased Bethesda Games for $7.5 billion and this will be the company's first E3 since that major acquisition. So what are we going to see from Xbox and Bethesda? We can expect to see a large look at the new Halo Infinite game which is planned for later this year as well as a bunch of Bethesda games such as Starfield, the much anticipated sci-fi role-playing game. And we should see plenty more that's coming to Xbox Game Pass, Microsoft's subscription service. Item number two, what is Nintendo going to have at E3? We've seen all sorts of rumors, including reporting from Bloomberg's Takashi Mochizuki on the upcoming Switch Pro, a hardware revision for the popular Nintendo Switch. What will Nintendo have to show for it? Will there be new Zelda, new Metroid, or big surprises? And of course, what will a virtual E3 look like? Traditionally, E3 has taken place in Los Angeles, where thousands of video game fans and industry members convene on the LA Convention Center. This time, it will be on online only. Will that sacrifice some of the energy and some of the hype that we've seen at previous year's E3? Or will it be just as good watching from your home? It remains to be seen, but we will find out pretty soon starting June 12th through next week. This is Jason Trier reporting from New York for Bloomberg News. For more on what we can expect from E3, we're joined by Doug Clinton, managing partner at Loop Ventures. Doug, good to have you with us. So what do you think is going to steal the show this year? I think Jason nailed it. I, I think all eyes have to be on Microsoft, and it is on the two fronts that he mentioned. I think that the Game Pass is really, I think, a window into the future of gaming. If we think about where gaming is going to go over the next five to ten years, it really will be more about streaming. It will be about online and on multiple devices, you know, not just the consoles and the PCs that we're used to playing on. And two, I think Microsoft has a little bit of an opportunity to redeem itself when it comes to Halo. I think gamers were really disappointed with the delays from last year. I think they were really disappointed with some of the early gameplay they saw last year, and that might have led to the delay. And so I think Microsoft really has a chance to try to blow people away with Halo Infinite and get people excited for that launch later this year. So what do you think the momentum of the gaming industry will be post-COVID? You know, I am one of many people whose family members turned to games uh, on lockdown, but now that the world is opening up, does the momentum continue? The way that we've thought about it is we think that the time spent in games, obviously, I think will go down as the world opens back up and people go back outside. Um, I think that it's logical to conclude that people will spend a little bit less time on devices. But I think the good news is that all the people that were sort of new to gaming, that were looking for new things to do over the last year in the pandemic, I don't think they're going to leave the gaming ecosystem. So I think that we have a lot of new players, a strong base that was really built over the life of the pandemic. And even if the hours spent go down a little bit, I think that the money people spend on gaming won't end up being all that uh, changed. The demographics have also broadened. Take a listen to my conversation with EA CEO Andrew Wilson earlier about that. Video games were for teenage boys, and now we see it from six to 60 and beyond. And what we see is that at least half, and, and in many cases, more than 50% of the population are women. You know, I'm watching my son who's six and my daughter who's nine get into gaming and, and, the, and the, the beauty of what games can bring and how I'm able to connect with my kids. There's no question, Doug, the demographic is changing, but who benefits from that? Which companies? Is it, is it EA? Uh, is it more social mobile games? Is it Nintendo? Who? I think it can be all of the above. I think that what we have is a really solid, strong, hardcore gaming base. The people who play Halo are always going to be very loyal to that franchise. The same could be said for Call of Duty, and those franchises continue to grow as they find new, new ways to monetize. I think what we're seeing, and EA may be a great example, is studios trying to diversify and bring more mobile into their platforms, more casual, and we're even hear, hearing more about hyper-casual games um, that have a very low learning curve, very easy to adopt for people, whether they're 6 or 60. And so I think you're going to see these gaming companies continue to be acquisitive, buying small publishers and adding some of these uh, easy games to play on mobile as part of their overall offering. 
So is there a sleeper company uh, party game we should be watching out for at E3? Yeah, I feel like I, I probably look at this company every year. I'm a little biased, but I always like to see what Square Enix is doing. Uh, it's a company that's traded in Japan, um, so it's, it's not as well known as some of the U.S. game makers. But they're launching a Galaxy of the Guardians game uh, this year. Uh, that's expected, at least, and I think they will. And Marvel stuff always plays well. So I think that has the chance to be kind of a sleeper or maybe a game people haven't been thinking about coming out of E3 that could steal a little bit of the show. All right. Doug, Doug Clinton of Loop Ventures, thanks so much for joining us. We will be watching the show as it kicks off this weekend. Appreciate you taking the time. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure you tune in Monday. We're going to be speaking to Microsoft President Brad Smith. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.